Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. Um, we're going to get started right on time. Um, so thank you for being here today to learn about solar land use laws that protect farmland in New York, support farms, and permit renewable energy development. Uh, the information that's going to be presented to you today by the three presenters that are on your screen is meant to supplement um, the readily available information already out there on designing land use laws for solar. Um, and you can find those, that, those materials um, from NYSERDA, the Pace Law School, and others. Before I go on, I'd like to take a moment to thank AFT's members, as well as the Land Trust Alliance and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation in collaboration with the New York State Conservation Partnership Program funded through the Environmental Protection Fund who all made this webinar possible today. And of course, to thank you all for joining us. During today's webinar, there will be, as I mentioned, three presentations and then time for Q&A. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, um, so everyone is currently muted. And if you have any questions during the presentation, you could type them into your question box, and then we will take questions um, and answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, after the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email with your land use training certificate, along with materials pointed to in the webinar, and then a quick and fun seven-question survey that I hope everyone will um, take. Before we begin, um, I wanted to use this fun new webinar feature of polls to get a better understanding of who's joining us today. So our first question here will pop up on your screen. And I'm going to give folks about 10 seconds to respond. Apologies that there's no other there. I know that some may fall into a different category. All right, I'm going to close this one out now. Okay, and then show the poll results. So this is really great. Uh, we have over 50% municipal officials, which a lot of this information is geared towards you, um, as well as planners. So um, that's really great. And then also ag service providers and then some state employees and renewable energy developers. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next poll. Okay, and give you another 10 seconds to answer this one, um, asking whether you have current solar proposals on farmland in your community. This one's an easier one, so I'll give you a little less time to answer. All right, okay, I'm going to close this one out now. All right, this is great to see. We've got um, almost 70% have current solar proposals on farmland in their community. So it seems like some of the information that we're sharing today will be really pertinent to what you're going through. And then, oh, I didn't share those poll results. So now you can see 67% yes, 18% no, and then 15% I'm not sure. Okay. And then one final question here. Okay. One final question asking whether you have solar land use laws in your community. And this one will be another quick 10 second poll. All right, great. I'm going to close this one out now. Get your final answers in. All right. So now you can see those results. Um, we have a little under 50% have solar land use laws in their community. Um, about a fifth currently developing. I'm not sure. 
and some don't. So great. This is really great information to have as we begin here. Um, I'm going to hide these poll results and then let's get started. All right. So I'm going to begin. If the slide will click. Great. Um, so first, I'm going to begin by giving an overview of the topic that we're here to discuss today. My name is Samantha Levy. I am New York Policy Manager for American Farmland Trust. American Farmland Trust is a national farmland conservation nonprofit dedicated to saving the land that sustains us. And we do this in three key ways, by protecting farmland from development, promoting sound farming practices, and by keeping farmers on the land. And here in New York, we've been working with local governments since the early 90s, helping them to adopt local laws and zoning that protect farmland in their communities. And um, here, what, what brings us here today is really the question of how to balance all of our land use needs in the face of a changing climate. Back last year, late last year, um, the IPCC put out another report that asserted that we must cut greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible, as quickly as possible, to stay below the one and a half degree warming limit that could trigger irre irreversible damage from climate change. And it's also important to note that climate change threatens farm viability and productivity through extreme weather events, um, pest pressures, disease pressures, and other unpredictable effects. But that also farmers are a potential key part of the solution, um, helping, for instance, helping farmers adopt practices that make them more resilient to or help to sequester carbon in the soils can help to mitigate climate change. And renewable energy siting, of course, can be a part of that as well. It's also important to keep in mind that we will need to produce more food in the future to support a growing population. Currently, we have about 7.6 billion people on Earth, um, but the UN projects that by 2050, that number will rise to about 9.8 billion. So on the current land that we have, we're going to need to produce more food to support that growing population. Let's drill down here to look at agriculture in New York State. Obviously, <laughs> this is not a surprise. Farms provide us with food and environmental services like the ones that I described. They're also anchor businesses in rural communities, often described that way. In New York, about $39 billion industry from agriculture, all encompassing, which supports 160,000 jobs using about a quarter of the state's land. And yet, even in spite of its importance, since 1980, we've lost about the equivalent of 5,000 farms to development in New York. Um, but it's really wonderful. The good news is that you're all here with us today because protection often needs to happen at the local level. Um, before I go on, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about a report that AFT released in 2018 called Farms Under Threat. This report is a multi-year initiative to assess the quality of America's farmland, threats to its future, and then also while offering solutions to ensure a healthy future for this irreplaceable resource of our productive farmland. What you see before you here is a map that came out of this analysis. In red and orange, you see the places where development took place on agricultural lands between 1992 and 2012. And something that came out of this report that really surprised us at AFT is that we're actually losing our farmland at a faster rate than we originally thought, at about three acres per minute. Um, and if you look over here in the eastern seaboard and in New York, it's no surprise that a lot of this development has taken place during that time in Suffolk County and the Hudson Valley and then around the big upstate cities. It's also really important to note, and this is key to our conversation today, that not all farmland is created equal. Some is just better suited to growing food to support our growing population. And 
Shockingly, um, we are losing our best farmland, most suited to growing food for human consumption at a faster rate. To break that down a little bit further, here you'll see on the right a map of our most productive, versatile, and resilient farmland. They're in green and in light green. First, productive uh, encompasses generally how people talk about farmland quality. These are your prime soils, your soils of statewide importance, your unique soils. This tells you the ability of the land to actually grow crops. Versatile, though, this is a new way of thinking about farmland. Versatile is the ability of the land to be used for growing diverse types of food, particularly looking at that grown for human consumption. And then finally, resilient, the ability of the land to be farmed over time with less environmental impacts. So this PVR farmland really comes together to show us a picture of that farmland that is priority to protect. And the good news is when you look and when you overlay our PVR farmland maps with our prime farmland maps, I believe PVR farmland encompassed all of our prime soils. So that is a decently good metric to look at um, without more information about where PVR farmland is in your community um, to look at prime soils and then soils of statewide importance as well. So let's, let's get to um, the, main, the main topic, renewable energy in New York State. So back in 2015, Governor Cuomo put forward reforming the energy vision, which carried with it um, an ambitious goal to generate 50% of our energy needs for our electric grid from renewable sources by 2030. In 2019, we ramped up and now have a new goal of 70% by 2030. So where are we now? In 2019, we're at about 28% of our energy being generated from renewable sources. So over the next 11 years, we're going to see a pretty significant ramp up if we're gonna reach and meet that goal of 70 by 30. Most of this power going into the 28% comes from hydro currently with a small share coming from solar and wind, um, but um, I think projections are that solar and wind will continue to grow to get us to 50 or to 70%. So um, this study was done before the 70 by 30 goal. So the um, acreage projections are even gonna be higher than what I'm sharing with you now. But um, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, did a study looking at one scenario um, that would get New York to 50 by 30 and um, said that we would, in this scenario, would need to add 6,800 megawatts of utility scale solar onto the grid. Um, along with onshore and offshore wind. But since solar is a more land intensive way to produce energy, and that's what we're here to talk about today, that is what we'll be focusing on. And maybe now is a good time to just mention that um, farming can really happen up to the base of wind turbines. So we're not as concerned about um, the conflict or potential conflict between food production and wind. So a good rule of thumb when thinking about what this 6,800 megawatts or now more um, will mean for our land in New York is that the rule of thumb tends to be five to 10 acres per megawatt. Um, and that would mean in this scenario between 34,000 and 68,000 acres of land converted to solar energy generation. And um, we're not making any more land in New York State. So this would be coming from the current land that we have um, and looking at where it can be compatible with current land uses. And it's coming at us really quickly. Uh, in 2018, um, there were 3,700 megawatts of utility scale solar uh, that were seeking interconnection. And that's a little earlier in the stages of their project, but they've already identified sites by this point. So um, many of you are uh, looking at those sites in your communities, it seems. So why, why create proactive solar laws that protect farmland? Why are we here today? Well, of course, as we've discussed already, to protect our most productive, versatile, and resilient farmland, which is a finite, irreplaceable resource that for growing food for the future. Also because farmland near transmission is a really attractive site for developers when looking at where they can put these solar projects because it's open 
open and sunny and sometimes well draining and flat. Um, and that's also some of our best farmland for producing food. Um, also, solar leases present an economic opportunity for our farmer owners, often providing them with much more income than they could make for farming. Um, so it's really important to consider how these projects can support our farm operations without converting our PVR farmland out of production. Also important to keep in mind um, that about 24% of our farmland in New York is rented. So for those landowners that lease land to farmers, um, if they enter into solar energy leases, that does mean a, a loss of farms and a loss of farmland for producing food. Also, no surprise to those that are on the call, New York is a home rule law state where local land use decisions are made by the, um, the local government. Also, um, I don't think that it can be understated how important it is to pass proactive solar land use laws because they define your community values and your preferences at the point of project inception to developers, maybe even before they look at your town or, or sites in your town for siting, um, they, get a, they get an idea, a really clear idea of what you want to see and how you want to see it done, where you want things to be put, and what your priorities are. So a really robust stakeholder process in that um, is really critical to reducing conflict down the road once projects are proposed. And ultimately, we do want these, these uh, projects to be cited in New York. We, it's from the IPCC report, really critical that we do address climate change. And um, of course, under 25 megawatts for those projects that are of that size, the permitting authority is in your hands, the local government. And even over 25 megawatts, when the state Article 10 process takes over for permitting decisions, they, um, they've been shown to take local laws into account. So it's really critical to have those in place defining what you like and what you want and what's important to you. And then finally, these leases um, tend to last around 20 to 40 years, um, but that this is something that uh, you could consider could be a longer term or more permanent land use. So it's really critical at these beginning stages to be intentional and proactive thinking about where and how we want these projects to be cited um, because they will define our communities in the future potentially. So um, what we uh, posit here at AFT is that with planning, with folks like those that are on the phone actively working on this, we can balance what seems to be something that could be in conflict. We can balance our need to produce solar energy and grow food and crops to feed a growing population. And we do that with smart solar siting. Smart solar siting maximizes the potential for solar in your community, so identifies the sites where you want it to go. Also minimizes impact on productive, versatile, and resilient farmland, that finite, irreplaceable resource. And it's written explicitly into policies and laws. And the webinar, the balance of the webinar today will be about how to do that. So over last summer, I read through hundreds of local land use laws concerning solar, and I've come up with some best practices and examples to share with you on those communities that have been very thoughtful about how to balance food production and supporting their farms with the need to cite solar projects in their community. What I found in those, um, those really strong laws was that they included a statement of purpose Something like, uh, it, it is, as, as stated in our comprehensive plan, it's critical to protect our prime soil, or it's critical to address climate change um, and to generate renewable energy and site projects in our communities. This one is really, really key. So if you're taking notes, put little stars next to number two. Define the important local farmland to protect or avoid siting on and I'll get into that a little bit. Prioritizes siting on unproductive or marginal land and also potentially even previously disturbed areas within your community like brownfields or landfills or carports or rooftops. Defines different approval processes for different scales and different uses. 
So for instance, small versus large, for on-farm use versus for sale onto the grid. And a quick note about on-farm use, I often saw um, an easier or simpler permitting process for those projects that would be sited on farms that were that the energy was going to be used by the farm. Um, and that's definitely an outcome that you want to encourage in your laws. I also found some instances and thought that this was really wonderful when communities required that developers follow the Department of Agriculture and Markets guidelines um, when sited on farmland. These will protect the ability of the land to be farmed in the future. And then um, when thinking about the present, there were a couple of instances where communities encouraged dual use or co-location on the same parcel of PV solar with active farming. Now I'm gonna go into a few examples here. So first, actually, I'm gonna do one more quick poll just to make sure that you're all still with me, asking you how you would define your most important farmland to protect in your community. I'll leave this open for a few seconds if folks can click and answer. Okay, so I'm going to close this out in a moment here and then share. So overwhelmingly, about three quarters of you said that you would define your most important farmland by soil type and then um, maybe a little under a quarter by crop type, which is very legitimate if it's um, an important crop for your community or for agritourism. Um, some others I'm not sure or said other. Uh, and all those are really legitimate. This is just an important way to, for you to start thinking about or continue thinking about the important local farmland um, to protect and write into your local laws. So to that end, here we have an example from the town of Marbletown. Um, they took the approach that they decided it was important to their community to avoid siting on these four types of prime soils and they got very specific with it. Um, conversely, in the, in the town of Danby, uh, they took a different approach. They, uh, they thought that it was important to limit the size of a project if cited on prime soils. And I've also seen other towns um, say it won't be larger than a certain percentage of prime soils if cited on prime soils, or to have some kind of offset, so some kind of equal um, uh, protection or um, just a, a little bit more of a balanced approach there. Okay, and then if, if your town decides that you want to have projects sited on farmland because it seems to be um, the only place in your community, then I, I highly recommend guiding siting to marginal or less productive farmlands or limiting impacts on PBR farmland as we saw on the last slide. Certainly to require that developers follow the department's guidelines, as I mentioned before, and here's an example from the town of Goshen about how they wrote that into their laws. And then I know that this can be a controversial one because this increases costs for developers, but um, I, I encourage you to at least consider including financial surety for decommissioning, uh, to think uh, carefully uh, within um, your town about whether you want to do that or not. And Matilda will say a little bit more on that later. And then let's just uh, have a quick, quick uh, overview of dual use. So this is um, something that's becoming a little bit more well known, but certainly still an emerging um, place where we need to learn a little bit more information. Commonly in New York, we see this around beekeeping, so planting of pollinators with having um, hives on site. Sheep grazing is a, is a really common one, and we've got a great association in New York that works on that. Um, and then also shade tolerant crops. So this is one where we're seeing more potential. The research on this is younger. But here on the left, you'll see a picture um, from Massachusetts of how they're looking at this. So the panels are a little bit more spaced out. They're higher so that farm machinery can get underneath. And they're growing shade tolerant crops because some sunlight is coming through. Um, so that, the, these are emerging areas that we could see in New York and one that we, can, we encourage you to consider particularly if cited on good farmland for growing um, vegetable crops. And to that end, 
when you're thinking about whether something is dual use, I, I really encourage you to consider soil type. Um, we, we're all learning more about this and we want to encourage developers to do this, certainly, but we also don't want this to become an instance of, for lack of a better word, um, greenwashing. We want it to truly be dual use or co-location of active agricultural production and um, solar PV energy generation. So do think about soil type. If, if this project is proposed on good prime soils um, that are good for active rotational cropland, consider if having sheep on there from time to time might really um, constitute active agricultural use for you and for your town. Um, and then also, um, I, I would recommend prioritizing active agricultural use to produce food for um, co-location rather than just simple pollinator habitat. So those are um, nice and can support neighboring farm operations. But really critically, um, learn whether a farmer was actively included in the development of the plan for that, um, for that project. Um, because if a developer uh, wants to have sheep grazing underneath those panels, they really should be talking to a farmer from the outset to make sure that they're designing it correctly. Um, in the town of Red Hook, here you'll see that there's an example on how they um, were looking to encourage concurrent use of the land for grazing or another sustainable use. All right, so um, I, in my follow-up email, will send you some resources, including a more comprehensive list of examples, um, some of the ones I've shared today plus more, and, uh, and some of these links for um, further resources. And now I'm gonna hand it off to George Franz, and he's gonna go more into the details of how to design zoning and land use laws to support and protect agriculture in the face of solar development. George? Yes, hello, Samantha. Am I coming through okay? Yep, perfect. Um, great, okay. Uh, let's just yeah, get going on to uh, the next slide, but um, renewable energy really has some potential large economic benefits for our farmers. Uh, they can certainly cut, it can certainly cut energy costs. It's another potential renovue revenue generator for local farms. And in the case of uh, some of the larger dairy operations, it's becoming an opportunity to recycle waste through the generation of biogas. Okay, um, next, I guess. Um, I write zoning code um, practically for a living. And I have some basic philosophies regarding agricultural zoning. Uh, agricultural zoning should first and foremost, protect the agricultural land resource. Uh, it should also promote the wise stewardship of the soil and water resources of the state of New York. But also, agricultural zoning also has to promote the long-term economic viability of our agricultural sector in New York. Next. Okay, next, yeah, okay. One of the things that I focus on when um, advising a community on their local zoning is to look at the definitions. The definitions are probably the most important part of a local or zoning ordinance or a local standard law renewable energy law. Again, a, an amazing number of New York State municipalities actually do not have zoning codes, but they do have or they can have their own standalone renewable energy local laws, okay? But getting back to definitions, a community really needs to make sure each definition in your local regulations is concise and clear as to what your community means and what your community desires. Uh, you've got to define any term that has a meaning that is specific to your local zoning code or local renewable energy law and your municipality. And finally, let Webster's take care of commonly utilized words. Uh, no need to clog your definition sections with them. Webster's does a good job already. Uh, next. Um, and again, some of the questions uh, in terms of definitions is, you know, what does the community need by solar energy? 
What does your community need, mean by wind energy? What does your community mean by commercial solar energy system or a commercial wind energy system versus a non-commercial solar or wind energy system? And you ask, what's the difference? I classify non-commercial solar or wind energy systems as generally being much smaller and their use is really for the specific property owner. And moreover, they tend to be compatible with other land uses in many zoning districts. So non-commercial uh, solar or wind, consider it sort of the personal systems for an individual homeowner, individual farmer. Commercial systems, however, are generally larger scale, generally produce power for offsite use, and can have much greater impacts and may not be appropriate for all zoning districts. And again, biogas, these are now being developed by larger dairy operations as a means of disposing of manure and reducing their energy costs. Uh, next. Um, <clears throat> one example of a definition, uh, the town of Geneva has adopted a new zoning law um, actually about two years ago uh, but the town of Geneva in Ontario County defines non-commercial solar energy systems as a solar voltaic cell panel or array or solar hot water or water collector device, which relies on solar radiation as an energy source for collection, inversion, storage, and distribution of solar for energy for electricity generation or transfer of stored heat, primarily for use on the premises. A lot of technical jargon there, but the key terms, words in this definition are primarily for use on the premises. It's not a system where they will be generating power for sale off the property, for sale to a larger market. It's a system that is designed to serve the property itself. Okay, uh, next. Uh, and again, non-commercial systems generally are much smaller in scale. And again, they're often utilized by farmers, homeowners, businesses, and industries. And my recommendation for uh, non-commercial solar systems and wind energy systems in an agricultural zoning district is that they be permitted by right. In other words, they're not, you don't require site plan approval, special permits, or any other sort of um, higher level review for them. Um, really, they're a small enough scale. They're part of an agricultural operation. At best, at worst, it's at most, a building permit application should be fine for that, okay? What you do need to do uh, within your zoning or renewable energy law is have reasonable setbacks and reasonable height limitations. And of course, the caveat to the farmer to avoid, if possible, high quality soils when they're doing um, solar energy. Okay, uh, next. Um, <clears throat> commercial solar energy, uh, again, is tends to be much larger scale. Uh, the town of Geneva defines commercial solar energy systems as an area of land or other area used for a solar collection system, principally used to capture solar energy and convert it to electrical energy to transfer to the public electric grid in order to sell the electricity to or receive a credit from a public utility entity but it can also be used for on-site use, okay? But again, commercial, the key thing is it can be much larger scale. Uh, actually, the one in the uh, photograph is, uh, came online this year in the town of Newfield, and it covers about 37 acres of land, okay? Uh, next. Uh, commercial wind systems. Um, Wind energy is, again, we pretty much agree that it's pretty compatible with agricultural uses. Uh, 
Wind turbines have a relatively small footprint on the land, but again, some design standards are still important. Um, access roads to the wind turbines should be designed so that they're flush with the surrounding land to permit easy crossing by farm equipment and minimize impact on the ag field operations. Of course, upon decommissioning, there has to be soil and site restoration uh, requirements, and these decommissioning provisions should be quite detailed, and they should be laid out in your regulations. Okay, uh, next. Um, commercial solar, uh, in the beginning, me and many other planners thought, oh, this is pretty compatible. But one of the issues that has come up over the last five years or so is um, really how permanent is a commercial solar system? And one of the questions or the debate really is um, whether these large scale commercial solar arrays can actually be easily dismantled and the land restored back to agriculture at the end of the uh, system's life, okay? Um, there is some question about that. Um, also, again, solar is very land intensive and, again, takes up a lot of acreage and there's potential pot competition between solar and farming and agriculture when it comes to higher quality agricultural soils. Um, our prime and farmland of statewide importance tend to be relatively flat and easy to both farm, but also easy to develop. And that is a consideration. Um, site plan review is appropriate, um, particularly for commercial scale um, solar energy. And I'll get into that um, in a, a couple more minutes. Okay, um, next. Okay, uh, commercial systems, uh, again, you need, need to make sure that they are permitted in appropriate locations within your community. Um, do you want your residential neighborhoods to be also developed for solar, or do you want to reserve that land for residential use? Uh, same with commercial uh, industrial land. Um, I highly recommend a site plan approval process for large scale um, solar developments. Um, a few reasons here. One, um, due to the size of a commercial array, uh, site plan review can uh, ensure that the proposed array complies with adopted community design standards. Um, site plan review actually also permits uh, state environmental quality review uh, for such projects. And I think this is actually quite important uh, for many communities because, you know, solar arrays are not without their own environmental impacts. Um, if you don't permit, if you do not have a provision for site plan review, often the permitting process falls into what the state uh, defines as ministerial decisions, and ministerial decisions are exempt from seeker review. So site plan review is important because it can enable this community to use the environmental impact review process. Site plan review also permits the public to participate in the decision-making process. Um, commenting on the potential impacts before the planning board, commenting on the benefits to the community of uh, solar energy, and but at the same time also suggesting potential mitigation impacts of um, for the proposed project. Okay, uh, next. Um, some of the uh, minimum standards um, that you should consider uh, minimum setbacks to property lines, roads, streams, wetlands, and adjacent residents if there happen to be some uh, 
in adjoining properties. Uh, height limits and also limits on site coverage. And I define site coverage as the total square footage of the solar panels plus any auxiliary structures and plus access roads. Um, and also, I do recommend a height limitation. Um, solar is an evolving technology, and I personally have no idea what come up, what might come down the pike in a few years or 10 years, including possibly, who knows, 50 foot tall solar arrays. And you have to ask yourselves as communities, do you want 50 foot tall solar arrays? Um, so yeah, don't forget height limits on these types of developments. Protection of prime soils and farmland of statewide importance. Um, and include a soil map as part of the requirement for any application. Uh, decommissioning site restoration plans, and also some sort of provision where the developer has to post some sort of surety to make sure that in 10, 15, 20 years, the money is there to remove the development. Okay, uh, next. Um, some basic design standards that I recommend, uh, requirements to avoid or minimize or avoid adverse visual impacts, including glare, especially on nearby residents. And this is really a siting uh, issue. Um, potential impacts on scenic and historical resources. Um, is the proposed solar array visible from some important community scenic resource or some important community historical resource that could be impacted or the enjoyment by the public of these particular in resources could be impacted? Uh, provision for landscape buffers, including plant type, Minimum sizes at plantings, I recommend five to six feet. If you notice in this picture, and this is like brand new, but those little arborvitaes are about three feet tall and about one feet wide each. Um, and they're also quite attractive as deer browse. So you wanna make sure that uh, you have, again, landscape buffers if you require them that really developer put in something that is actually going to work as a landscape buffer and of course something that's not going to be attracted to deer. Uh, other uh, standards, requirements that all on-site utility transmission lines be placed undergrounds, uh, requirements for fencing to discourage unauthorized entry, and also construction of all weather roadways within the site. Um, who knows when throughout the year heavy construction equipment will be required to go into the site to correct some sort of issue. Okay, so really all weather roadway systems are very important. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, decommissioning again is very important and the site plan approval process must should require a decommissioning plan uh, for review by the local town before construction starts. And again, the plans, a decommissioning plan should include a time frame for completion of site restoration. Um, example might be that solar array shall be uh, decommissioned and removed within 12 months of use being abandoned. Okay, uh, provisions to restore the site to a useful condition, and that includes the removal of above ground and below ground equipment, structures and foundations, uh, restoration of the surface grade and soil after removal, um, including uh, de-stoning the soil, because again, a lot of stuff has been churned up in the construction process of building a, uh, the solar array. And finally, upon decommissioning and removal, uh, the, the decompacting of soils, um, particularly if it's being restored to agriculture, as well as revegetation of restored areas. So, 
I guess next. And I think, yes, thank you very much. Uh, any questions in the future, uh, I'm here available by email or phone, um, but I will turn it over to uh, Samantha and Matilda. Great, thank you very much, George, for all that detailed information. Um, next, we have Matilda Larson, who's going to provide us with a case study from St. Lawrence County. Um, looking at the time right now, it's about 1, uh, I'm sorry, 12.45. Um, so Matilda's going to present, and then likely we will, she will finish probably near to 1 o'clock. Um, so for those that have questions, please type them into the box, and we can go over um, for those that want to stay on for the question and answer portion. Um, but certainly, if you can't stay on, um, we'll be sure to follow up with you um, because we can see who asked the questions and we'll make sure that we get them answered for you. So, uh, Matilda, please take it away. Thank you. I will uh, I will try to stick to areas that um, I will try to not be redundant and uh, simply go over those areas more quickly that have been covered by George and by, um, by you. And uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. So this particular map uh, is an indication of where the prime soils are located in St. Lawrence County, which is along the St. Lawrence River in northern New York. Those areas are shaded in the uh, dark green and light green. And then overlaid across that are uh, lands that have been indicated by local assessors according to land use classification or by agricultural valuations which means that at least seven acres has been put in, into production and that the farm operator is generating at least $10,000 in annual sales receipts. Um, and this map uh, was created with uh, the help of a variety of local and area stakeholders. Um, and some of these local organizations may be useful to local boards in identifying where your prime soils may be located. They include your soil and water conservation district, the county planning office, a uh, local university GIS lab if, if one is available, your local assessor, and your county real property tax office. So uh, we were able to rely on those types of individuals uh, in, in helping us identify where our active agricultural lands were in production. And what we found in the dark green and the light green uh, is that those are the lands that are available to us, which is less than one in every five acres. Um, a good example that I use when meeting with local boards is, in all likelihood, the county courthouse here in Canton uh, was built on prime soils. So it indicates what's available to us. It doesn't necessarily indicate that it is in active agricultural production. Next slide. Uh, superimposed over where lands are available, it is helpful to identify where your high voltage transmission lines exist, uh, and those are indicated in all the squiggly lines that uh, go through the county. You'll note that we have uh, two sources, two parallel lines that flow from uh, up on the very top of the map in Messina and down into Krogan. Um, and we know that the New York Power Authority recently announced their, their intent to upgrade one of those high voltage power lines. Uh, we suspect it's to accommodate new renewable energy systems. So developers are really paying attention to this. They need to be proximate to these high voltage lines. Uh, and you can see uh, that it happens to go along in areas of land where uh, farmland is in production and where prime soils exist. Next slide. Uh, the agricultural industry for St. Lawrence County is very strong. Uh, in, in 2017, according to the latest Ag Census, it topped out at over just 191 million. Uh, a significant uh, a contributor to the uh, ag industry is dairy production. Um, we happen to be one of the top 10 producers uh, in the Northeast milk market order area. <laughs> What's a lot of words, but essentially it's an order area that extends from New Hampshire all the way down into parts of Virginia and Maryland. Uh, across the United States, dairy production ranks 53rd. Uh, and we are also second in uh, position in the state for hay production. So it is a valuable resource to us. Uh, especially in light of the transition from manufacturing jobs to service industry jobs that we are witnessing across rural America. Next slide. 
So uh, both Sam and George talked about prioritizing farmland. And what these bullets identify are those at the very top are the uh, lands that are in active agricultural production that are very important to your local farming industry. And I would encourage local jurisdictions to focus on the bottom third when it comes to the siting of uh, solar arrays. They include uh, your pasture lands, support lands, and lands that are either fallow or inactive. And to really do your best uh, in your written local land use laws on preserving the, the lands that are used for active rotational crops and permanent haylands. Next slide. Uh, the following slides are slides that I share with local jurisdictions. They provide a re visual representation of what your local land use laws should look like. Uh, and I'm going to go through with examples. In the top left corner there, you see the, a very good job of concentrating an array on a single lot. The lower right-hand photograph uh, is a proposed array that was to be sited in a light industrial zone in a community. Um, and what I would have focused on is encouraging the developer to actually rotate the footprint of the array in a counterclockwise direction and to set it aside further west on the parcel so that an additional land use could be situated into this industrial park. So left-hand side shows a really good example. Uh, right-hand side is an example that could use some refinement and improvement to accommodate a future use. Next slide. When it comes to the siting of the arrays on a parcel, uh, we really encourage uh, local jurisdictions to require developers to st stockpile the topsoil in the event that footers are being used uh, to situate the array and that this, the soil be uh, put back down and reseeded and regraded uh, once construction is complete. Next slide. We have also seen developers propose the use of ballast footers uh, as the foundation for these arrays. Uh, essentially concrete with metal uh, laid on top of crushed stone and geotextile woven fabric. Because of the length of the lease with the options to renew um, and possibly seeing a 40 year time span for hosting these arrays, our conversations with our local county highway engineer indicated that you'd want to specify that the fabric below be identified as a monofilament woven geotextile because uh, this geotextile fabric is sensitive to UV light rays from the sun uh, and will de uh, decompose over time and its integrity may not be successful when the array is removed. Next slide. Features to avoid in the event that an array is going to be situated on farmland are all those improvements that the farm operator has worked hard to increase and maximize the productivity of his lands. They include avoiding areas where it has been drain tiled, areas where diversions and ditches exist, as well as fencing. Next slide. Uh, when it comes to the construction of access roads to uh, reach to the solar array, we recommend that those access roads be located along field edges, and you can see a really good example of that on the left-hand side. Uh, and what you see here on the right-hand side is, is not a very well-developed road that goes right through the bisecting uh, field that is in production. So left-hand side, go along the field edges where practical, and on the right-hand side, try to avoid the bisecting of lands because uh, if you've just taken active agricultural lands out of production with that. Next slide, please. For path construction, George talked about this a little bit. Uh, we recommend the use of geotextile fabrics, as stated before, so that any new road can be constructed at grade and not exceed 16 feet in width. Uh, even more ideally would be the use of um, temporary timber mats that could be removed after construction. We do understand that these uh, facilities do need to be accessed and serviced on a periodic basis. So at the very least, uh, the road should be constructed at grade to minimize disruption of farm equipment that has continued to be used on the land uh, in and around the perimeter of the property. Next slide. As for the transmission lines that would be installed uh, for bringing the power to the grid, ideally, as George had mentioned, those should be put underground at least two to four feet deep. Uh, but if that is not practical, then we recommend the installation of taller utility poles with larger spans to accommodate farm equipment that may be running in and around the facility. Uh, and to keep the installation of guy wires to an absolute minimum, 
When it comes to the height of utility poles, our conversations with CAFO operators have indicated that no utility line or power line be less than 20 feet from uh, above finish grade of the power uh, of the facility when the construction is complete. That'll help minimize any interruptions with the farm equipment as it uh, accesses the fields in the vicinity. Next slide. As for site restoration, George also mentioned this. We talk we talk about the importance of uh, decompacting the site, uh, removing any rocks that may have come up during the construction process, as well as any uh, material debris uh, from construction. The decompaction should occur to a minimum of four feet in depth uh, to, to regrade the site and to reseed it so that areas could be put back into production uh, and revegetated and monitored for at least one uh, season of uh, growth to see where any water may be standing and to regrade and reseed as necessary. And I realize this photograph shows uh, uh, commercial wind turbines, uh, but it is a really good example of how the developer was able to accommodate that. And that was based on the strength of the language in your local land use law. Next slide, please. Uh, as for decommissioning, uh, this is a previous site for a solar array out in Bakersfield, California. It was uh, done in the late 90s, I believe. It was about 177 acres. Uh, and it's a really good example of why decommissioning uh, provisions should be specified in your local land use regulations. Anything that is put into the ground should be taken out to a depth of four feet. The site should be decompacted anywhere between one and a half to two feet. Uh, access roads, uh, I would tend to defer that the discussion be held between the developer and the farm operator as to whether or not they should be taken out. The same would go for the transmission lines that are put in. Uh, I suspect those are going to become permanent features of the landscape. Um, whether or not they are taken out can be up for discussion between the local board and the developer. And in the instance uh, that the solar company is no longer around at the end of a 40-year cycle, the decommissioning funds do be set aside so that the local jurisdiction can remove those kinds of equipment that may be abandoned at the end of the lifespan of the facility. Uh, in our conversations with municipal attorneys, they have talked about using an irrevocable line of credit as being the uh, preferred source of funds uh, because it's easier for local municipalities to access that in the event that decommissioning does not occur uh, by the developer. Next slide. So a lot of the information that we have shared with you have talked about uh, how to accommodate solar arrays on farmland. What I would like to really encourage local boards to examine is identifying those areas that are alternatives to prime farmland. And they can include any of the following. Uh, capped landfills that may offer a base load of methane uh, for production when the sun sets or when we have our very long dark winters. Uh, establishing arrays at former quarries that are no longer being used for extractive purposes. And that's what you see on the right-hand photograph is the Novato uh, solar farm, which encompasses 11 and a half acres. And then looking at remediated brownfields, which in all likelihood also have high power transmission lines uh, at an industrial site that may no longer be uh, suitable for future uh, commercial activity. Next slide, please. Uh, here's some more examples of repurposing former uses. Uh, I found these both on the internet. Um, the Dennings Point Landfill Project in Beacon, New York uh, was on 11 acres. It accounts for about 60% of public power usage, uh, enough to support roughly 1,600 homes. Uh, the local jurisdiction was able to enter into a power purchase agreement so that uh, energy developed by the array helped uh, realize the savings for subscribers who participated in the project. For the former Brownfield uh, in Palmer, uh, the Palmer Airfield in Massachusetts, uh, enough energy was produced for, to support 1,000 homes, and a, tw a $2 million pilot was secured between the local jurisdiction, or the IDA, and the developer for a 20-year 20 20 year span. Next slide, please. In addition to negotiating pilots, where, which are a separate activity from uh, your local permitting, uh, the town of Enfield in Tompkins County uh, developed a really interesting policy that in order for solar developers to secure a pilot, they needed to provide a community solar agreement. Uh, and that would allow 
local residents to subscribe to an array when they have land or building rooftops that can't readily host an array on their own property that they could subscribe and benefit from the power production uh, as a result of hosting the array in, the, in their community. And what the local residents found was that it yielded a 10% discount in their first year, uh, and that di discount diminished over a period of time, but there was some sort of economic benefit uh, in exchange for hosting the array in their community. Next slide. All right. All right. Um, thank you so much, Matilda. Um, so now I just want to quickly point to uh, few upcoming events for folks that want to learn more. Um, we will have more smart solar siting webinars. Um, we're also going to be the Farms Under Threat report from AFT that I mentioned earlier. We'll have state level maps coming out soon um, so you can take a look at where PVR farmland is located um, and have that be a little bit closer to your community. Um, and then uh, we will be hosting a forum um, in conjunction with the Long Island Farm Bureau and the Nature Conservancy on smart solar siting and co-location in November on Long Island. Um, so look out for some of that. And then um, now that we are to the end of our webinar, um, I've been getting some questions coming in. So if folks want to stick around to um, Here's some Q&A, you're welcome to. I expect that this will take probably no more than 10 minutes. Um, but we will certainly, for those that can't stay, um, or for those that asked a question and had to leave, we will follow up with you directly to make sure that you get an answer. Um, so uh, beginning here, there were a few questions asking if we can provide some more examples. Um, we will certainly be following with the, up with those in our thank you email for attending the webinar, so you'll get those in your inbox. My contact information, George's contact information, and Matilda's are all up here, so you can, I think it's safe to say that you can reach out to us at any point with specific questions or for technical assistance, and we can help you out. Um, I, there was an interesting comment, and there were a couple of things that looked a little bit similar, so I'm going to address this here as well. Um, somebody said, solar doesn't need to take farmland irreplaceably out of use, even if it wasn't used as farmland for 30 years, right? It's not paved over or otherwise developed necessarily, but, but best practices sound good. So um, basically, this is something that comes up often, this idea that, well, putting uh, farmland into um, solar energy generation uh, is probably better than paving over it um, with a strip mall <laughs> or with houses. And there's more of a chance of it being put back into production if it's gone into solar rather than being paved over. That is objectively true, um, but it's also, as I said, important to keep in mind that we don't know how long these projects will last. But that's why it's so critically important to think about how it's constructed, how it's being operated, and how it's decommissioned with an eye on the potential use of that um, parcel for farming in the future. Um, and, and then somebody asked, is that enough? Are the department's guidelines enough? Well, I think that um, we're all in a learning process here, learning what the environmental impacts are. Um, so it's the best we have <laughs> is the way that I would answer that question. Um, I want to read out a point that um, David Kay from Cornell University made. Uh, he, he mentioned um, that height restrictions were discussed, that that's good general advice, but it's also important um, to think about while there are reasons to keep the panels low, some height restrictions might be too limiting. Um, for instance, the technologies that are being tested that are looking to vault panels up higher, like those that we saw in the picture from Massachusetts. So. Um, Keep in mind when you're thinking about height restrictions that there are some nuances there. Which brings me to a comment made by um, Bill Jordan, who is a solar developer but works with farmers really closely. Um, and his company is called Jordan Energy. And um, so he, he mentioned that there was a reference to pollinator-friendly solar um, not being as beneficial as food production, which was something that I said that's true. Um, and he mentioned that he works closely with farmers, 
um, and specifically that they compared planting pollinator-friendly seed mixes and beekeeping to grazing goats on the same seven-acre foot. <coughs> Um, and that the pollinator-friendly solar with beekeeping worked out to be twice as profitable for the farmer as the goat grazing on the same seven-acre footprint. Uh, and then he says, in addition, we have uh, a severe problem with lost pollinator populations, which is true, um, and feel strongly that pollinator-friendly seed mixes are more valuable than other ag uses under consideration. So a couple of points there. Um, goats, I've heard from many people, are not quite as compatible as sheep grazing, um, but that doesn't address the, the broader uh, point that you make, which I think is true. And I think that the key here is that Bill consults with farmers and talks with them about what will be most compatible or, or best on that parcel. And so if I, I say that that is a best practice. And if there are developers that are doing that, that are really having active conversations with farmers, and the farmer says, pollinator-friendly seed mixes are what we need here, and that's gonna make me more profitable, then that is certainly something um, that, that the um, town board should take really strongly into account. Um, Matilda, if you wouldn't mind, um, there, there were a couple of questions on where folks can find GIS data on high voltage transmission lines. Do you remember where you found that information? I actually had a lot of difficulty trying to find it uh, on my own and ended up speaking with colleagues at GIS labs at Clarkson University. And I do know that they ran a query uh, and provided it to me. I would be happy to forward a copy of the URL to you because I don't remember what it is offhand. I know it's a really long one. Um, so Samantha, if you'd like, I can send you a copy of the link uh, that we can share with the rest of the, with the, rest of the participants. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Matilda. I will, um, once I get that from you, I'll, I'll send that along in the follow-up because it seems like really useful information for the folks that are on this call. So I haven't had a chance to look through a lot of the rest of the questions, but um, we will certainly be answering the other ones that come in through email. Um, and... If there's anything else that we missed here. If you don't mind, apologies for the pause. I'm just gonna take a quick look through the rest of the, the rest of the questions that came in to see what we can answer here. Hmm. Um, there was a question about using former landfills and brownfields, but in their area, it's typically the farmer seeking out the solar companies to earn additional income. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is a balance between supporting our farms, supporting private landowners and what they want to do with their land, um, but also uh, ensuring that as the local government that you're balancing sort of the broader resource needs. So I think that um, my best advice here is having a really open um, process of discussion as you're developing these laws um, before there's a project in your community. Once there's a project, I, I mean, I always think that open communication is the best bet. And um, if there are some farmers that really do want to put their land into solar, that that is truly their prerogative, um, but that it's it's really imperative on those of us who are responsible for managing the broader um, goals for our communities, those of us in government, to think about balancing private needs with public good. Um, George, Matilda, anything else to say on that or any of the other questions that I breezed through? No, I think you covered it really well. Yeah, I think I just have uh, one response. Um, I certainly agree that Yes, removing a solar array is a lot easier than removing a shopping mall or parking lot. Uh, no doubt about that. My concern is that the cost of removal may be grossly underestimated because people don't understand that it takes heavy construction equipment and a lot of effort to remove the posts that have been in the ground for like two, three, four decades possibly. Okay, it's not a matter that it's 
um, it certainly can, a solar array can certainly be removed from the field and the site restored. My concern is that uh, the money, an adequate amount of money is not allocated to make sure that happens, okay? Okay, yeah, thank you, George. Um, got another question. If 6,800 megawatt nameplate capacity um, is the goal, that's 68,000 acres, is that maximum or will we need even more? So just um, remember that this was a scenario, um, one um, theoretical scenario that could get us to 50 by 30. So uh, certainly not an order um, or a goal, um, but given that the, the need is higher than that, 70 by 30, or the goal is 70 by 30 now, um, it could be potentially more than the almost 70,000 acres that we mentioned here. Um, we will send more information on decommissioning because a lot of folks are asking for that. Um, on, on costs and other things. And, um, oh, the other point that was made was that the, the shade tolerant crops under panels, that that is not yet proving to be a viable option. So as I mentioned, I just want to make really clear that the research on that is very young and that um, the state of Massachusetts is doing a lot to promote, um, including uh, price adders, so they have some pricing incentives for the sale of power for those developers that are co-locating projects with active farming. Um, but that, that that program was just started up in the uh, recent past, so we're still waiting to see the effects of that program and exactly what that's going to look like. So I, I tried my best to get through and look through all of these questions here, but I promise that I will um, follow up with folks that we didn't get a chance to answer your questions and make sure that we answer them to the best of our ability. And um, uh, all that's left to say is thank you all so much for spending a portion of your Monday afternoon with us. And um, it's been a pleasure to be here with you. And I will follow up with um, all the information that we promised to follow up with. And then also, please, please do take the survey that I send you. It will help us make sure that we're providing you with the most helpful information for the future. And then just to remind you, of course, to reach out to myself, George, or Matilda with any other questions at any time. Thank you very much. <laughs>